Welcome to Forging the Future, Decarbonizing the Steel Industry, a Hatch podcast series. I'm your host, Sakshi Suchteva, and invite you to join us on a journey through the challenges and innovations in iron and steel production. Discover how Hatch's century of expertise is shaping a sustainable future for the steel industry. Stay tuned as experts from Hatch share their insights on technology, market dynamics, and the path to decarbonization. Today, I have two Hatch veterans and specialists, Ian Cameron, Principal Engineer, Ferris Metallurgy, and Chris Walker, um, Global Director of Electric Furnaces Technology. Welcome, Ian and Chris, to the show. Chris is the Global Director of Electric Furnace Technologies at Hatch. Can you share what is Hatch doing, both as an engineering service provider, as well as a technology provider, specifically in the electric smelting furnace space? Yeah, so Hatch is named for a gentleman called Jerry Hatch. And Jerry Hatch himself was, before he started the company, was a metallurgist at a Canadian company called Quebec Quebec Iron and Titanium. And at QIT, um, there are electric furnaces for producing iron from a ilmenite ore. And so Jerry Hatch was the metallurgist and responsible for the operation of these furnaces. The history of iron making at Hatch goes back from the beginning. And uh, when he founded the company, he and his colleagues, uh, one of them is my mentor, is Bert Wasmund. Both of them are now in the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame. They took that electric furnace technology and, and transformed several industries, including ferro-nickel including platinum group metals. Uh, they really advanced the technology over the years to next generation. We'll try and part, tried to continue that pioneering, mentored by some of the best. And so we've been working on this for a long time. My personal uh, involvement, I joined Hatch as a process engineer in the iron steel group. My introduction to iron making and electric smelting furnaces is back in the late 90s. Um, doing some consulting work with Iron Dynamics. Uh, We did some work at Highfield Steel to convert the furnaces there to improve operation of iron making furnaces. And my own personal history is over 25 years of working on this problem. In about 2007, I believe, we piloted a a process which we call CRISP for continuous reduced iron and steel making process. Uh, We piloted a Steel, direct steel making process from DRI in the 2000s. And um, we're now trying to adapt that technology to this problem I described, of producing hot iron from low grade glass furnace, create pellets. So we've been working on this for 60, 70 years. Me personally, for almost 30. So Chris, what about the experiences with the uh, iron sands business? Yeah, that's a good point. So we um, we helped New Zealand Steel about the same time I talked about, around 2000, early late 90s, 2000. We helped uh, New Zealand Steel optimize their electric furnace melters, iron-making melters from uh, pre-reduced iron sands. So there's a lot of history there. I should mention, in parallel to all that work on iron-making, we were also um, continuing to advance the technology in other industries in terms of furnace technology and furnace equipment design, where we've really led the charges in back to the ferro-nickel, laterite smelting and ferro-nickel. So in that same time period, we've taken those furnaces up to 100 megawatts. So we now have electric smelting furnaces that are a reasonably large scale. It's as a scale, it's sufficient now to be applied to the iron making industry where we need big scale. So a lot of that work's been done. There's a scale up. Do they match up well with the uh, with the Midrix and Energy and Iron processes? Correct. It's a good point. It's it's a continuous process in terms of capacity, in terms of both being a continuous processes. They're well matched in terms of logistics and material handling, in terms of their availability and uptime, and in terms of scale. Now, with the equipment technology at the state of development where it is now, there's a good match with the uh, shaft furnace. Why is the replacement of this blast furnace, a century-old process, um, such a technical technical challenge today? Well, the blast furnace is a very mature process. It's been uh, used for several hundred years, and it's highly optimized. It's a terrific furnace. It uh, 
has a, a very high thermal and chemical efficiency, more than 97%. It produces at a very large scale. A blast furnace, single blast furnace and a BOF plant together can make more than 5 million tons of steel. Um, so it's well established, but it, it really gets a success from using fossil fuels, coal, principally coal and, and iron ore. So matching the scale and efficiency and the resource base is, is, uh, makes it hard. The other thing is carbon is used both as a fuel and a chemical reductant. So just replacing it as a simple fuel isn't, isn't possible. So the challenge is there. It's a clever two-stage reactor where, uh, where uh, one reactor is on top of the other which also makes it technically challenging to replace it with just another reactor of similar, similar kind. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you've been in the iron and steel industry for over 40 years now. I have, yep. Yeah. So over the course of your career, um, what are some of the decarbonization initiatives or strategies specifically for the blast furnace that you've, you've seen in the past? Well, the steel industry has been trying to replace the blast furnace for 50 years, and, and the main desire was to replace metallurgical coke. There was a feeling that metallurgical coal would run out, and uh, there's also the cost of converting coal into coke and, and also fine iron ore into pellets and sinter. Uh, there have been many initiatives that have been tried by many national governments, and almost all of them have failed. Uh, so the, the challenge is, is, is really quite significant uh, from a technical viewpoint. Um, the, uh, the one that has emerged is the uh, natural gas-based direct reduction process with two very well-known processes, the Midrex process and the energy iron process. But even after all this time, they only represent about 7% of global steel production. The blast furnace, using all the carbon that it does, almost two tons per ton of steel, produces 93% of the world's iron, and we need to convert that and grow that amount over the next 30 years. So we've talked about the modifications and initiatives to decarbonize the blast furnace. In terms of the industry achieving its decarbonization goals in the long term, such as the Paris Agreement goals, what are what are maybe some of our options to massively transition to an alternative process technology, which which it does not only meet the carbon emissions reduction targets, but is also able to produce the steel at the scale that it's required. Well, to replace carbon, we really only have three choices. We can use uh, we can use hydrogen, we can use electrons directly, or we can use biomass or biocoal. The latter, biocoal, is, is quite challenging. Just the, the sheer amount of material needed is uh, huge. Um, and the hydrogen and electrons require a huge, incredible amount of power. But the processes that are being developed now, they're, they're quite active. Uh, our fluid bed reduction processes, HI4 and HIREX, are two of the uh, processes being developed to use hydrogen. And um, for using uh, electrons, there's aqueous electrolysis and uh, high temperature electrolysis processes that are being developed. But these are all today in the pilot stage, and, and they're aspiring to be in the demonstration stage by the end of the decade. But there's a lot of work to get these to make the massive amounts of iron units that the world needs. What about some of the modifications in order to decarbonize the blast furnace BOF route itself? Well, there's been a lot of work that was done in Europe with something called the top gas recycling blast furnace, where uh, the gases are uh, refined, the carbon monoxide is removed and re-injected into the furnace. And it was demonstrated about uh, 20 years ago in the, in the European Union, and it could reduce the carbon emissions by about 25%. The, the project didn't go forward in the EU because their objective was to get to zero and didn't seem to be a clear pathway to do that. But uh, it has got some great interest in other parts of the world, and if you can combine it with carbon capture, you can even lower. So there is active piloting going on in Japan and China right at the moment, and a lot of interest because uh, it allows the uh, continued use of the existing uh, Blastworks BUF uh, systems. So we touched upon the modifications to decarbonize the blast furnace. Um, in terms of the industry achieving its decarbonization goals, such as the Paris Agreement goals, what are some of our options to massively transition to perhaps an alternative um, process technology in the future? Well, what many steel producers are doing today is uh, combining the direct reduction process with electric arc furnace steel making. Uh, it's been established and it's well known. Um, and, and, it, and it will work, but it does have some, some very serious limits. Uh, the first one is uh, using scrap. Uh, there's just not enough scrap to replace all the iron ore in the world. This simple, and particularly in many regions, there's very little scrap. Uh, the second is uh, is the iron ore that's used in that process. It has to be very, very pure, almost pure hematite. 
And uh, this is to reduce the amount of slag that's made in the electric arc furnace. Making slag at 1600 degrees Celsius is very quickly becomes uh, an economic penalty that the electric arc furnace can't bear. So we need to use the iron ore that is currently used today, and that's going to require a new process. The other thing with the electric arc furnace is there's some steel quality attributes, namely the nitrogen, phosphorus, and, and copper levels that need to be fairly low for particularly sheet steel mm -hmm. uh, products. And uh, these are difficult to achieve in electric arc furnace, but they're readily achieved in the BOF process, which is long established. So one of the, uh, the technologies that's uh, really got a lot of discussion is the electric smelting furnace. And the benefits of that are it, it's very friendly for handling large amounts of slag, and it uh, produces uh, iron with low nitrogen levels, and uh, we can manage uh, phosphorus, and ultimately the BOF uses a lot less scrap, so the impurities that are associated with scrap are, are lower. So the steel producer can maintain the same quality of steel that they, that they have today, uh, using an electric smelting furnace combined with a direct production plant, be it a shaft furnace that exists or the future fluid bed processes that may emerge. So maybe I can direct this question to you, Chris. What What is an ESF and can you maybe elaborate more um, on the process? So an ESF is a really general term to refer to a furnace technology that's really designed for handling raw materials that are less refined. Um, a lot more gang materials or impurities, we call gang in the steel industry. And so they're typically characterized by, by very large furnaces, um, handling a lot of material, a long residence time of the material within the furnace because there's a lot more chemical work to do to refine the materials. And you're creating a lot more of a, a molten material of the impurities that floats the surface, which we call the slag. There's also differences in how the energy is released into the furnace relative to an electric arc furnace, which people are familiar with to the steel industry, where a lot of the energy is literally being released as an arc of electricity passing through air between the electrode and a metal scrap or metal bat. In an electric smelting furnace, a lot of the energy is actually passing through the slag layer. The slag acts as a resistor, so you're actually directly heating the slag with electricity. And so that's a fundamental difference. But, but you really think about it as a furnace that's designed to smelt materials that are of high impurities and or need a lot of chemical work to refine them, metallics in the feed. What differentiates an ESF from an EAF? Why can't, why can't we do everything we can do in an ESF in an EAF? An EAF is, is a small, very intense furnace, and it's a batch furnace. It's primarily designed as a melter to melt relatively high purity metallic materials, and it does that very well. If we were to try to process these lower grade materials, materials with more gang, more impurities, that means you're, you're producing a, a, a large byproduct slag and in e, trying to do that in a small EAF in a very small, intense batch process, the result of that is you lose a lot of iron. The iron then doesn't come out of the slag. You don't get the same recovery of the iron. So the yield losses then would be, be uneconomic. You also have to uh, heat up all this slag to 1,600 degrees, which is very energy intensive. And uh, uh, the, the smelting furnace can run on a, a lower temperature. Which, which helps both the yield and the thermal efficiency or energy efficiency of the furnace. Mm -hmm. what's, what's kind of the history behind these furnaces? Is it a fairly new process, an old process? So ele electric furnaces in general is a, a very old process. Um, the original demonstration of electric furnace goes back to, I believe, 1879. It's actually the first demonstration was melting scrap materials of, of steel and copper. About the same time, people started investigating using electricity to refine a large number of ores. The first commercial applications of an electric furnace actually preceded the EAF, so the first commercially viable furnaces were developed for calcium carbide and phosphorus, for those are more of the smelting furnace types. At the same time, there's a lot of investigation into smelting all kinds of different ores, and in fact, including iron ore. So even here in Canada, there was a lot of work to develop smelting uh, iron ores directly in an electric furnace. 
So that history goes back to the turn of the last century. Um, since that time, the electric furnaces have been adopted for a lot of these melting applications. Um, and a very good example that's somewhat analogous to what we're doing here would be to look at uh, processing laterite ore. So laterite ore is a, a low-grade iron ore, but it has nickel in it, so it's processed because the, the nickel in the low-grade iron ore uh, makes it economically viable to process. Laterite ore was first processed in blast furnaces about the same time as this electric furnaces were being developed, um, in commercializing uh, laterite ore processing in blast furnaces. But really, it was in the 50s then the nickel industry, the laterite ore processing industry, converted from blast furnace to a rotary kiln electric furnace process. And that is very similar to what we're talking about today in iron. It's a it's a direct, it's a reduction of the ore, pre-reduction of the ore in a solid state to do some of the reduction in solid state, feeding that material to an electric furnace to do the final smelting in an electric furnace. And so since the 50s, that's become the standard for laterite ore smelting to produce ferromickle. And that furnace technology has advanced from the 50s, doing that at a scale of 30 or 40 megawatts to a scale of about 100 megawatts today. At the same time, um, related to iron, it's also iron making is quite old as well. So at the same time, the ferro-nickel process was being developed. Uh, a fellow by the name of Marvin Udi, I think inspired by this, said, well, maybe we could use that process to smelt the iron ore. So he patented a process for direct production of iron ore in production of iron in an open bath electric smelting furnace. That time was patented, that was actually piloted here just down the road from where we're sitting in Niagara Falls in, I think, the late 50s or early 60s. It was commercialized at a plant in Venezuela in the 60s. So that is actually the basis of what we're talking about today. It was actually developed in the 50s and 60s. Um, and there has been other applications of so using spelted furnaces for producing iron um, for some specialty iron ores like ilmenite. Uh, vanadium and titanium bearing ores, like New Zealand steel and the iron sands and high filled steel in South Africa. So there's been a number of uh, electric furnaces used to make iron. I think there's about 20 of them still in operation today. So it's, it's an old technology. Thank you for diving deep into the history of the ESF and how it came about. We understand now it's it's been around for, for years in, in many different industries. Do you think it's the right choice for iron and steel? So we're seeing a lot of interest today from the large integrated blast furnace BOF producers um, that are producing steel from virgin iron units. I think their interest is, is, is coming from the fact that they're looking for a solution to replace the blast furnace while retaining their existing BOF and steel making assets and processes. So I think the industry is seeing this a uh, combination of the well-proven shaft furnace technology that we talked about with Ian, with an electric smelting furnace as a very good application to replace the blast furnace. And the reason that it's an electric smelting furnace rather than an electric arc furnace is that this allows us to um, process the same raw materials that are being fed now to the blast furnace. So the, the real advantages of the electric smelting furnace really around the raw materials, the flexibility in raw materials. It's well-suited for lower-grade iron ores. It's well-suited for the internal oxides and reverts within the plant. So recycling uh, streams within the plant can now be recycled into this vessel. So from a raw material use uh, perspective, it's a good technology. Um, from a product perspective, it's a good technology because it, it allows the steel makers to continue to produce their high quality, low nitrogen products. Um, it enables that, which we don't believe the EAF does. Um, and in addition to a, a quality iron, it allows these high quality steel products. You're able to make a slag that's saleable and usable. You're able to make an off-gas that is usable as fuel. And so um, from a product mix, it makes sense. And finally, from just an efficiency uh, perspective, it, it makes a lot of sense. It's actually a fairly, very thermally efficient machine. 
Um, so from a thermal efficiency perspective, it's also very good. And one thing I forgot to mention is, is within that uh, production of the products, it's a high iron yield. So because it's a large furnace, a long residence time, and a big sort of inertia of material within the furnace, there's a lot of time to complete the uh, reactions that need to happen for the final reduction. So it produces a high yield. So you're recovering most of the iron that you're putting into it. It's being recovered valuably. What's, what's this CRISP process? Well, we developed it in uh, about 20 years ago with the idea of eliminating a step to go from direct reduced iron to steel in one step using no gaseous oxygen, just using oxygen from various waste materials. And we did it. We pro processed it and tested it in Sweden, and we were able to make steel very comparable to what the BOF is. Sounds like a great idea, and it is. We're pursuing it, but the industry is more interested in making iron right now and keeping the BOF. But we, we like to promote this because... Uh, it could be another step. First, they make iron and later steel and when they BOF. The furnace is very similar. So uh, so we really think the, the, the ultimate way we want to do this is eliminate a step by using the furnace to make steel directly. Uh, that was the goal 20 years ago, worked very well. Uh, but the furnace, as Chris has mentioned, is very flexible. So we're going to go with iron, which what the industry is asking for today. In fact, with that same furnace, if we start making iron in it, we can use the same furnace to then convert to direct steel making in the future and eliminate the BLF plant in the future. So it gives some forward progress to simplifying the steel making process, further eliminating emissions and still preserving the good quality steel that the world needs today. And it also gets around the scrap problem because uh, uh, we'll use less scrap and more iron ore, and scrap will become a precious commodity. Already is, but it'll become more pre precious in the future. So what is what is preventing the industry from adopting this technology, say, tomorrow? So I, I personally think we're ready to go. I, I think the, we know the process works. We, we know the equipment technology is appropriate. Um, I think there's still some concern. I talked about the large scale of the furnaces, but it, it's still not at the scale of a blast furnace. So I think there is still some concern about the, the scale and the economies of scale you need in, the, in this iron and steel making industry to make the economics work. So the, the scale is maybe a bit of a barrier. Um, and I guess in, when I talk about scale, there's a scale of the process itself, the process units. There's also a scale of the size of the challenge that Ian mentioned, the amount of capital and resources and people we need to actually make this massive transformation is not insignificant. I hopefully described to you the fact that this is a new technology, really, but I don't think that's well known or well understood. And obviously there's a fear of the unknown. So I think a lot of education, teaching people about the technical aspects of this is, is will be crucial so that people are ready and feel comfortable to adopt the technology. Thank you for for sharing your insights and what, especially what Hatch is doing in this in this space. Um, what is the one key message that you'd like to give to the audience today? For me, I'd like to let people know we have a massive challenge, a massive job ahead of us. But I believe the, the technical aspects of that are mostly solved. We have a technical solution. We have a technology we know that works. We just need the political will, the people, the resources, the commitment to actually make it happen. Ian, what is, what is one takeaway that you'd like to... Well, I always say it comes down to iron ore resources, and uh, we can't walk away from the massive amount of iron ore resources we use today. And the electric smelting furnace gives us an opportunity to use those resources quite efficiently and to be able to also uh, match up well with the various energy reduction processes that uh, are, are going to come into place. So being able to use those IRR resources efficiently and not create additional waste is really important. Thank you for joining us on Forging the Future, Decarbonizing the Steel Industry where we navigate the complexities of iron and steel. We hope today's episode has provided you with valuable insights into the sustainable transformation of the industry. Remember, the path to decarbonization is a collaborative effort and every step counts towards a greener future. I'm your host, Takshi Suchdeva, 
and along with the entire team at Hatch, we appreciate your engagement and curiosity.